This is the Landlord Survival Show. When people stop being nice and shit gets real. You're the landlord. We're here to help. This is the show for what the gurus don't tell you about owning rentals. We're here for you because we're stronger together. Brought to you by Empire Industries Property Management. Built for investors. By investors. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Landlord Survival Show. This is your host, Steve Rosenberg, and I am the owner and the co-founder of Empire Industries Property Management Company. Uh, we manage about a thousand properties here in the Houston, Dallas, and Fort Worth area. And um, not only do I own a property management company, but I'm an investor. And I actually started investing and the property management company kind of became a derivative of me owning my properties because I was really having a hard time finding someone to manage my properties the way an investor would, thinking like an investor, um, just really having a struggle with that, finding like-minded people, which um, is really hard to do. Uh, everyone's got a business, everyone has different business models, different goals, some don't have any at all. And so when you own properties, obviously you're looking out for your best interest of making money and kind of keeping your sanity and not letting everyone kind of pile on top of you. So when you're in this world, it's really hard to find like-minded people, not just people that are kind of dipping into your wallet, taking your money. Um, so we ended up creating our own management company and uh, still buying properties, still own properties. We do it every day. Um, we're still in the mix along with managing about a thousand properties. But what we found is there's a lot of people out there that are just like us, that are investors, that have very successful ways of self-managing. They've got ways, some things that are good, some things that are not so good, um, just because of scale or attention or they don't have the business model. And you know, let's face it, when you own a rental property, and especially if you own multiples, there are just gonna be days that you just get hit in the mouth and that you really don't wanna get back into the ring and you don't wanna deal with the next day it could be a vendor, it could be a house that flooded, it could be an option contract that's about to expire. There's a lot of things that happen. And so the reason I created this show is so that other investors can come on, we can have conversations, we can kind of hear their stories and kind of how they get through the day. Because, you know, we all watch TV and Instagram and Facebook and everyone's kind of got this guru and everyone's an expert and everybody has the shiny car, but nobody ever talks about it the day-to-day -day operations of what is going on, how you deal with failure, how you overcome it, um, you know, how you went from doing your first deal where maybe you were super nervous and sweating to your 10th and your 20th deal to where you're not even thinking twice about it. There's an evolution in that. And I like to talk to people that are in the industry that are doing this, that are very successful in this. And so I get people on the show that want to talk about, you know, they're, they're willing to open up and talk about their their wins and their losses, and, and it's hard to do. I Trust me, I, I don't like talking about my losses, but I think my losses are what have got me to where I am today because I've learned from them. I've learned those lessons. So if you want to know more, you can go to our website. It's selfmanagemyproperty.com. We also, uh, the Landlord Survival Show is on iTunes, so if you uh, would subscribe to that and pass it on to someone else, I would appreciate it. I spend, uh, invest my time doing this. Uh, I don't do it for money. I don't take sponsorships. I do it to try to help investors. So my only request is that you pass it on and share it with other people so that other people can listen to it um, and they can learn from it. And also if you do manage your properties, go to selfmanagemyproperty.com and I have a manual there. It's called the Ultimate Landlord Survival Handbook. And that book is there to help you, the investor, basically not make the mistakes that I've made, not make the pitfalls. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to, uh, Welcome my guest. So Gloria, very nice for you to come today. I appreciate having you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me. So if you don't mind, if you could just tell everyone maybe a little bit about you, um, about who you are, what you do, um, and how you got into real estate, and then we can kind of go from there. Um, I, I am a wholesaler, um, investor. We also rehab properties. Um, I started in real estate back in 2004 when I had just had a baby and I really didn't want to leave her with daycare. So I got my license and, uh, and I started out as a retail real estate agent. Okay. And so 2004, so that I actually, I got into it in about 2002 after 9-11. So you and I are, are uh, same, same uh, time frame, I guess, give or take. And right. um, what, let me ask you this. First of all, what have you noticed different about the industry then 
to the industry now? Because it, it has evolved. I mean, it's only been, what, 15 years, which in, in real estate is not a long time. But I think in, in our market, I think it is a long time. What have you noticed? Well, remember back then when we used to have to use key maps <laughs> to drive everywhere? Yeah. And now, thank God for Google Maps, you don't have to, you know, look at the book real quick while you're driving. So that's one huge plus. And now we have uh, things like DocuSign and DotLoop. We don't have to actually physically go get a contract signed. Now we can get it just digitally signed. It's just so much easier. That's true. It's funny. I used to go and get, I used to, you know, do a lot of option contracts. And I remember going to the house, going back to the house with the option, with the assignment, all that, and multiple trips. And I can remember many times that, you know, I, I would lose a paper, something wasn't signed, it wasn't legible, I have to make another trip back out to the house. And I don't even, I don't even think DocuSign was around back then. Maybe it was, but I, I'm not sure that it was. But I, I, it's funny, you don't think about what you didn't have. And now you're like, how did we live without it? I mean, even just having a cell phone, you know, how could you do real estate without a cell phone? I mean, how did people do it? You know, all those miles that you put on. Yeah, your yeah. So, okay, so you got into, you were a realtor and so, did you get into wholesaling right away or did that evolve from being a realtor? I, back, back when I got into real estate, I didn't even, I didn't know what wholesaling was until actually three years ago when I got into it. But, uh, I, I just did retail. Um, it, it was okay, you know, showing houses and, uh, I, I really didn't like I didn't really like the buyer representation, but I definitely do like listing uh, as opposed to buyer's agent. Um, I, I was interested in the investment side of real estate, but um, you know, as a real estate agent, just because you are a real estate agent doesn't really mean that you know the investment side. The investment side is, is different. You know, they don't teach you that in school. Yeah, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road, as I like to say. That's that's where that's where it gets real, right? I mean, you know, they can teach you how to list and show a property. They can teach you how to buy a property with right numbers, right? I mean, metrics and KPIs and spreadsheets. Everybody's got this app and all this stuff. Now, <clears throat> what I always tell people, they don't teach you what happens when your house floods and you have to put your tenants in a new property. Right. They don't teach you when mold is an issue. Like, those are the things that you can't teach that. It's like, trying to teach someone how to golf, right? It just, it just doesn't happen until you're actually out there or, you know, when you're wholesaling and you have a deal that's going sideways and you're trying to figure out how to save it and you're trying to negotiate with, you know, everyone around. I mean, that, that's not really something that they can teach you, right? I think that's probably why a lot of licensed realtors don't understand wholesaling because they don't teach you that. Right, yeah. Well, I think what happens is, is, you know, inherently, if we don't know something, our immediate subconscious reaction is to say no. Right. <clears throat> and you know as well as I do, I, get, I used to get, when I, I was wholesaling for a long time, and I would get so many people saying, you can't do that, or that's illegal. And I said, really, well, what are you basing that on? I don't know. It's like, so you're just saying it? You don't even know the facts? Well, right. it doesn't seem like it should be legal. It's like, okay, they do it all the time. It's, it's, it's completely legal. It has nothing to do with being illegal or immoral. Yes, there are people that probably rip people off, but that has nothing to do with being legal or illegal. That's, that's, that's running a business or not running a business. And that's what jails are for, right? And so I, I, I think that a lot of people, when they don't know what it is, and they kind of go, how did you make that much money that quickly? It must be, there must be something wrong. So you can't do that or that. Or I used to love hearing, that doesn't work here. Really? I'm only about 10 miles from where I just did another deal, but this doesn't work here because why, you know, and everyone has a reason, right? I'm sure that you run into that a lot. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, once you, once you make your first wholesale check as compared to a real estate check, you're like, wow. I mean, well, I've been wasting my time. Yeah. yeah this is amazing. So let, let's talk about that. What, so what, it was three years ago that you transitioned from realtor to wholesaler, right? Well, so um, back in, uh, you know, I, I was a real estate agent. Everything was going, um, you know, as well as I wanted it to be. I, I, put, I put as much time as I wanted to put into it so that I could take care of my daughter. Um, 
and but then the the whole 2000 you know 2007 2008 crash happened so i actually went and got myself a regular job um i actually started working for uh, the city of houston real estate and so that's that's how i kind of made it through that whole survived right you know i kept my license uh with with them but i mean it really it's a totally different type of real estate um but actually i i actually transitioned from that also into paralegal i guess i i guess what you can say is that i really never i really never felt like whatever job i was doing i didn't feel like oh this is my calling this is what i want to do for the rest of my life you know so i went from that to healthcare. then i did you know um paralegal uh still didn't like i guess i i i don't know i've just never been a i want to be employee type of mentality i've always been more of an entrepreneur right I've always had that mindset my father was an entrepreneur so i've always felt like i didn't want to work for anybody but myself so, so let, let me ask you this so when you went from when you said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to wholesale or I'm going to wholesale my, let's just talk about your first deal, right? I want to talk about your first show because there's a lot of people that listen to this show that want to get into this. They, they kind of want to jump on this carousel of wholesaling and real estate, but they really don't know how to get on and they're nervous. Right. So what was kind of going through your mind? Can you walk me through your first deal and kind of mentally, you know, you, you've got to make some decisions and the contract goes hot, you know, or hard or whatever you call it nowadays. But, you know, the contract went live and now you're dealing with it. Now that the clock is ticking. So can you walk me through your first deal and kind of what you mentally went through? Well, let me let me uh, tell you how I, I even got into. Hotel. OK, so I actually I was working for a commercial real estate company. I was the paralegal. I was drafting all these commercial contracts. I actually got into a car accident and I was home uh, and I was on painkillers. You know, I was still trying to help, you know, from from home. Um, and I ended up, uh, going back to work. They wanted me to go back and I actually got fired my first week back. And I had already been going to, you know, little networking events. I was already looking into maybe doing some direct mail marketing and I get fired. And I said, you know what? I am, I'm definitely not going to go back to a nine to five. So that was my opportunity to, to jump and, and, you know, cause I was already considering it, you know, but I, I was kind of, that's it. This is do or die now. You know, I, I still need a paycheck. So I, I, I treated it as a regular job. The fact that I was unemployed and I started doing, uh, I started going through Craigslist, um, looking at, you know, for sale by owner type things. And I had a notification on my phone and I had a notification that came through my phone that said, you know, this lady was looking to sell her house. And I immediately jumped on, on the phone and called her and I said, Hey, you know, I'd like, I'm interested in your property. When can I come look at it? And she said, well, you can come tomorrow. I have somebody coming tomorrow at nine. I said, okay, I'll be there at eight. And so she said, okay. And I, I, I she gave me the address. I ran my comp. And I, and I called her back. I said, you know what? Your numbers work for me. Let me send you the contract right now. Wow. She was a little bit, she was a little bit, um, I guess she, she was kind of like shocked. And I said, look, uh, your numbers, I mean, just estimating the repairs and, and you know, what your home is worth. I, I'm, I'm good with your number. And so she said, well, let me talk to my husband. Cause I guess that kind of freaked her out a little bit. Too quick. Right. She, she thought that was kind of unusual because I knew somebody was going to go at nine right. and I wanted to be the first one, you know, first one in. Were you willing to go a little bit higher just to kind of get your first one done? Like, or were you sticking with your numbers? Cause sometimes I know I sometimes would make a deal work in my mind because I just wanted to get the deal done, not because it made sense. And I, that got me in a couple, couple of hot waters of not almost not being able to get rid of the deal. So yeah. were you, was that your case or? Her number was actually, you know, pretty good, you know? Okay. So, so I, I, she didn't call me back like 20 minutes later, I called her right back. Um, and I said, Hey, can you give me your email address? I'm going to send you the contract. And she said, okay. I spoke to my husband and he said, that's fine. 
So I did, I sent her the contract, she signed it, and I did meet up with her the next day to go look at the property and take pictures. The numbers worked. And that was my first deal two weeks after I got fired. Wow. So, you know, it's, what's interesting is I've always, I've always heard this and it's so true. And, and I don't know who said it, you know, but it, they said people do what they have to, not what they want to. Right. So, you know, you may have always wanted to get into real estate, but it wasn't until you had to get into real estate that, right. it was, hey, I'm not going to feed my kid and I'm going to not be able to have a house. I need to figure this out. And, and you did. I mean, it's, isn't it interesting that, you know, I, I always notice that as people get more experienced, they almost collect more baggage of no's and more reasons why they can't or shouldn't do something where, right. you, you know, looking back, I know there's a lot of things I'm like, man, I probably shouldn't have done that or not sure that was the smartest thing or don't know if I could have. But at the time when I was doing it, same thing. I, I threw an ad in the green sheets and I got a property and I, you know, ended up flipping it and wholesaling it and worked great. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know if I was doing it right or wrong. It was a double closing. Didn't know what that meant. I showed up and was told, sign here, sign here. But it's funny because had I known more, I may have talked myself out of why that wouldn't have worked, you know? I think I probably would have, if I still would have stayed in that position in my, you know, in the job I was working, I probably would have been too scared to jump and really just get, you know, get down and and start working on, on my business. But I took that as an opportunity of, you know what, I'm not going back to work. And, and it worked. I mean, I, I've heard a lot of people, you know, it, people's stories vary. They took a month to get their first deal. They took a year to get their first deal, but I knew that this was what I wanted to do. And I mean, it even made it even more, it, it solidified that decision when I got my first deal two weeks after, you know? Yeah. It, it kind of makes you go, okay, this works. I can do this. It's not that complicated. And, you know, it, it's funny because so many people will talk them out of a deal themselves for all the reasons in the world, you know, and, and it has nothing to do with reality. It's all made up in their head, but they've justified it. So it is real. And it's like, if you justify it in your mind enough, that's your reality. And so that, that's good. Good for you. So now I didn't have money for marketing. And after that check, I said, wow, okay. Now I have money for marketing and now I can really get into this. So it sounds to me like you took the approach more of a business than just kind of a hobby. Is that, is that a safe statement? Oh, yeah. yeah. Cause I, I've just, I've noticed words that you've used so far and it's, you know, you came from a business world, you were doing paralegal stuff. You, you know, you, you it sounds like you took a, a, an attitude of, Hey, I've got a deal. The numbers made sense. Not, Hey, I really want to just get a deal done. Right. The numbers made sense. I'm going to send you a contract. I'm going to follow it up, blah, blah, blah. So it, it sounds like you were a lot more methodical than probably most people are. I knew I wanted this to be my career. I knew that it was going to be the stepping stone for me to be able to, to build the capital that I needed to flip because that's how I first started. My, my whole idea was like, Oh, I want, I want to flip, you know? But then my husband suggested, well, why don't you look into wholesaling, use that as a stepping stone to flipping. And, and so that's really what, what, uh, what my, my thought process was. So okay. yes, I definitely did treat it as a, a business or career for myself. This was never going to be, well, let me try it and see if it works. I sure. knew it worked because I was seeing other people do it. Right, right. So, okay, so then are you, are, what are you doing now? Are you doing mostly wholesaling, flipping, or combination thereof? You know, I've actually, um, I did it alone for two years. I, I was wholesaling for two years by myself, but I could honestly, I think I maxed out what I could do on my own. I, I, uh, I felt like I probably needed to partner so that I could grow my business. So I'm currently... We're currently, um, I've partnered with a couple of, of ladies. Um, that's been also somewhat of a challenge to find the right people to partner with. Sure. Um, and so that's what we're doing. We're actually getting ready to, we've actually hired two acquisitions agents. Um, we have several cold callers um, and we're getting ready to just take, you know, get it going in the Houston market to, to scale up is what we're doing. So let me ask you this. Um, let, let's, I want to, I want to talk more about the partnership. 
Um, but let's talk a little bit about as you were doing deals. And, and again, I know a lot of people like to hear about this. They don't like to hear about people's misery, but they do like to hear about lessons. Yeah. So have you done any deals, which I, I've got to imagine you have, where the deal just went sideways. It was, a, it was maybe a disaster. It just didn't work out. Um, what, what do you have that you can share with people that they can kind of go, okay, that was something I can learn and a lesson from it. Well, so it's funny because my first deal went sideways. My very okay. first one. So I definitely learned a lot from that deal. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't smooth. The closing wasn't smooth. You know, it was a, a, a man and a wife and, and he was pretty, you know, kind of macho type guy. And, and the, the title company made a mistake on the, on the HUD that they signed. The, the numbers were wrong. And, uh, and I actually lost out on that um, because since the title, he wanted to hold the title company to, to the number that was on the HUD. Uh. And, uh, and the title company said, no, we can't. We have to fix that mistake. He didn't want to go back in and sign. And, and that was going to, you know, I had, I actually said, okay, well, either I get some money or I get no money. Yeah. So I had to. And you already put all the work in to right, it. Right. I said, okay, well, I mean, I'll take the hit. And that's, I mean, I did, I took the hit. I went from, I was supposed to make an, my first fee was supposed to be an $8,000 fee. And I think I ended up making five. So, I mean, I took a $3,000 hit. The, the title company didn't want to. Um, they didn't yeah, nobody wants to, so they look at you like, well, you might as, you might as well take the hit. It's like, right. yeah. Right. So that one, I mean, it's a lot of, you know, just working with people, and sometimes they have difficult personalities, they have demands, and, you know, sometimes you just have to make it work. It's not always going to be a smooth process. So let me ask you this. What lesson did you learn from that? What lesson did I learn from that is I have to be more meticulous when it comes to looking at my HUD statements and making sure that all the numbers are correct. Yeah, yeah. Because normally if something is not in anyone's favor, it's normally going to be yours that it's not in your favor. You know, I mean, they're going to, even if they messed up, they're going to try to come to you and say, you should take the hit. Let's just get it done. And sometimes you're like, you know what, I just want to get this over with. So you do that. But then you, after a while, you go, wait a second. Why should, I, didn't, I didn't make the mistake. Why should I take the hit? That's not fair. And the title you know? company wasn't going to, we asked them, they said, hey, you guys made the mistake. Now you guys should pay for it. And they said, well, we're not paying for it. So yeah. I said, okay, you know what? We got to get this deal done. Everybody's already signed. We need to get this guy in to, to you know, sign the correct document. So now I, I try to be more meticulous about what I'm looking at. So yeah, that's, that's very, very important. That, that's a good lesson, too, to make sure that people are, you know, meticulous when it comes to doing their, uh, their HUD and their numbers and everything. Because, again, you know, when you're doing these numbers, it's, they're not always exactly correct. And they don't always come out in your favor, especially when it comes to closing. So I can definitely see that. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. What, um, the, you, you mentioned the partnership. So tell me a little bit about the partnership, kind of how it was formed, how, you know, who, who's bringing what to the table and, and everything. You know, I am the type of person that um, I guess I expect from a partner what I give. Um, and I guess that you could say that that's probably been one of my biggest mistakes in wholesaling and partnerships is that um, sometimes people say what you want to hear. They say the right things. Um, and it's been, it's, that's been a, a, a difficult, um, I expect commitment, I expect hustle, I expect loyalty, um, and that's difficult to find. It's, it's hard to find somebody that's as committed to your vision as you are. So, um, you know, we went through a, a couple of, uh, of people, and I think right now we're finally, it's the perfect team, we're all on the same page, uh, we all have the same vision, drive, commitment, hustle, um, but it's it's definitely difficult to find somebody that's as committed as you are. Well, I, I think the challenge too is is uh, I've known a lot of people when I when uh, my business partner Pete and I owned some apartment complexes. You know, there was a lot of partnerships, and uh, I had a good friend of mine that owned a lot of apartments, and he had about seventy partners. And he said, if I could sell them all and get rid of all these partners, I would do it in a heartbeat because 
says it, the way he the way he at, said it was basically you know it's like you're dating someone and they're on their best behavior and now you marry that person in a deal and now you find out they're crazy and their expectations are not aligned with yours they're, they're completely different and you know he he kind of blamed himself and said you know I didn't set the right expectations initially with them and we never talked about if we're going to get divorced how we how that happens right. and he said you know if we separate in the business and we have to separate the business model how do we do that and, and I don't know you know you have to actually have that ugly conversation where yeah we hope it's going to be great but if it doesn't go great cuz look a lot of people get involved in partnerships one person puts up the money, the other one puts up the sweat equity, or, you know, you, you know, everybody brings something to the table, everyone's bringing a piece of the pie, and together it's going to be bigger. Everybody has these ideas of grandeur, but the reality is, is you've got to ask yourself, why are they not successful on their own? Right. And if they are successful on their own, then you got to say, why do they need me? Right. So you got to keep asking questions, and I think sometimes people kind of go, okay, this person seems like they're good at marketing, I'm bad at marketing, so you know what? I'm just going to get them and hope and pray that we have a good marketing team and we'll handle it then. And that's not really the best way to go. And I, I don't know if those are things that you've experienced. And then exactly. when, the, you know, was. go ahead. What were you saying? Yeah, that's what my mistake was, was thinking that, okay, well, they bring that to the table. I bring this and thinking it was just going to work out and it didn't. You know? And everybody has a different perception of what they're bringing to the table. They're going to go, wait a second. I, just because you work five days a week, I only work two. That's my that's my ethical code. That's my that's my bio clock or whatever they have. And you're like, wait a second, this is a business for me. I work seven days a week, not five. And they're like, oh yeah, I don't do that. I I I have time. You know, I gotta walk my dog. I, I don't get in until 10 a.m. And you know, so again, I think it's important for people that are watching this that if they're gonna have a partnership program, you really gotta talk about the ugly part, the ugly side, and, and what could happen if you separate how do you separate and you know and i don't know if you did this with your current team but setting setting job descriptions job roles kpis metrics these yes. are the things you've got to do because you you have to you can't just hold someone accountable on theory right and so did you did you set that up from lessons learned that, on this was, that was the mistake that we made was that we didn't set those expectations we didn't set job roles we didn't have core values you know we we weren't on the same page I mean they not not ev everybody says they want this but they don't want to put the work in you know so yeah. we didn't do that in the beginning and so now we have definitely set it up that way to where okay you're in charge of this I'm in charge of that you know we hold you to what your your job your job role your role is you're you're responsible for that role and, and our core values, you know, we make sure that, is this you, does this describe you, you know? So, um, yeah, it was a lesson, but, you know, it, it's a tough lesson. Well, it, it is, but, you know, I mean, look, at the end of the day, you don't, you don't really know where something's going to go. I mean, obviously, you, you seem very business savvy, and it, it's not like you're a bunch of friends getting together and saying, hey, maybe let's buy a house, and we'll go from there and let it grow, because that's really what me and my business partner did after we sold the apartment complex, we were kind of like, hey, let's buy some houses and just see where this goes. Next thing you know, we own 35 houses. We bought the wrong properties. There's no, there's no systems, no procedures. It was, it was beyond chaotic. A lot of, lot of lessons learned. But, um, you know, now in our business, you know, we have organization charts. We've got job duties. We've got descriptions. We've got meetings. I mean, you know, had we started our business model that way originally, we probably would have gotten a lot less arguments and a lot less, you know, who's doing what and confusion and loss of tenants and, you know, everything that goes on with that, the lessons that, you know, hopefully you've been able to avoid by doing that. Um, so let me ask you what in this new partnership, let's talk about this. Um, what is kind of your biggest fear with, with this new partnership? Because you're, I'm guessing there's things that they're doing that you're not and, and you've got to, um, be responsible for at some level, right? On a financial level or, or a production level. So what are some of your fears regarding that? Uh, you know, some of my fears is maybe, you know, not being on the same page, having a disagreement. Um, I guess my fear would be the same thing that has happened to me in the past where you have somebody that's not on the same commitment level, uh, unresponsive, um, just not, not, um, 
putting in the same work as you are. So, um, I mean, I guess that that's, that's my fear right now, but sure. for the team members that we have currently, um, I feel like it's, we're definitely all on the same page. I, I feel like I'm definitely partnered up with the right people now for sure. Good. So let me ask you this, how, how, how do you balance the work life relationship? You know, you, you're at home, you've got a family, you've got a, You've got a business that's growing. Now you're going into a new realm of, of a business model, which a lot of investors want to get into. They want to be you. They want to be the person that's, you know, got a partnership that's growing. But then there's the, the home life, which we all know as entrepreneurs, you know, it's, I don't believe there's such a thing as a balanced life personally. Um, as much as I wish there was, I think the reality is some things need more attention than other things, but then you got to, you got to recorrect. In my opinion, you correct one way, then you got to recorrect the other way. And it's a constant zigzag of life. How, how do you handle that? You know, you're, you're correct, Steve. There really is not a balance. Um, and that is why these partnerships didn't work because um, I guess they still wanted to be able to go home at five and not answer the phone, turn off, um, still be able to go do this and go do that, you know, with their kids. But honestly, um, I am sacrificing now so that I can have financial freedom later. Um, I definitely, if I'm at dinner with my family and I see that a business call comes through, I'm going to answer it strictly because that's what allows me, um, to be able to do the things that we do as a family, you know, like go out of town, go to concerts, go here, go there. I mean, I think my family, thank God that they, they do realize that they, and they are supportive of the fact that, um, yes, family is very important, but you know, the business is also, it's important as well. And so that's, what's important about a partnership is to have people with that same mentality that, you know, as we're growing, it's definitely going to require more time. Let me ask you this. How many, um, do you guys have uh, types of meetings as a team of, of where the company's going and what the goal is of the company and kind of the strategies? Do you, do you guys do those often or is that not yet? Uh, are you not at that mature level yet? For sure. We've actually, we were meeting uh, every week on Monday, um, but because we are scaling up uh, and we've implemented a bunch of, um, of uh, systems, so that we can systemize everything. Um, we've increased the amount of people that are working for us. So we've definitely uh, started meeting every day until we implemented, you know, these people are working for us. They're gonna be using this system. Now these agents over here are gonna take care of this system over here. So we've actually been meeting every day for the last two weeks um, until we get everything uh, in place because we're going to expand not only into Houston, but we're going to be virtually going into San Antonio and Dallas. And then after we set up San Antonio and Dallas, we're going to go out of state. Uh, we analyze our zip codes and which ones are most, uh, have the most um, activity and success. So it's definitely been a meeting every day until we get Houston completely set up and we can move on to the next market. So are you gonna have actual boots on the ground in these cities or is it gonna be all virtual as yeah, far as making calls? Or? Boots on the ground for sure. Yeah, definitely have to have boots on the ground. Okay, so let me ask you this, when it comes to scaling that, cause I know a lot of guys that are doing this and trying to do this, what do you think is going to be your biggest challenge with, with finding those boots on the ground? Is this, uh, are you gonna have more of a, a, of a call center type thing here in Houston and then they're just the ones going out or how, how do you plan to do that? Correct, yeah, it's more of a, a call center type thing here in Houston. Uh, our agents here in Houston will be the ones taking the, doing the sales in the virtual market okay. that we so need boots on the ground. And that'll be working with other realtors. Um, we'll pay our realtors to buy them, so. Um, we have somebody that's actually coaching Great. us through this whole uh, growth period that's already successfully doing it. So um, we're very blessed to be in the position that we're in right now. So let me ask you right now, what is your number one focus? If you could say, if you could, if someone, if I walked up to you on the street and I said, what is your focus? What would you say that is 
for 2019? Our number one focus is growth, for sure. Oh, okay. So what, let me ask you this. Do you and your, your, uh, your business partners, do you guys believe in, in like continually self-developing? Do you guys read? Do you guys audio books? Like what, what do you guys do? Seminars? How do you learn? The first book that we read as a group together was Traction. And huh. that book actually helped us. I mean, like I said, we didn't have core values. We didn't have any of the organization that we really needed to have uh, as a group to be able to grow. And so we definitely, you know, read books. Um, we recently, even though we've been doing this for a year, we knew that we wanted to get to that next level. And we invested in hiring a coach. We went to a seminar. It was, it was an excellent eye-opening seminar. Um, we invested in, in hiring him as our coach to take us through this transition. So we definitely um, believe in, in self-development for sure. That's good. Yeah, we, we, uh, similar to you, we have a business coach, had him for six years, still have him to this day. We go every week. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we actually run our business off of traction. So right. we, we very much, we have the L10 meetings every week. Um, we have them from seven o'clock to eight thirty every Tuesday morning. We have the company scorecard, and it's it's a little tough. You're you're gonna have to you're gonna have to grind some things out. But I will tell you that it'll it'll make you a better business person. It'll make your business run optimally, which I think is very important right now. We're talking about a business, not you flipping wholesaling properties, which I think is very very important because I think what a lot of people don't understand is whether you own a rental property, whether you're flipping, whether you're wholesaling you own a business and there's policies, there's procedures, there's structure, there's so much. So the fact that you're doing all that at the ground level is so smart because you're going to be so much further ahead. The other people that they kind of get on the highway, get going and try to figure it out. And I, I, I joke with uh, my good friend, Daryl Dyke. It's like, it's like building a plane while it's in the air and you're flying it sometimes because Things are changing, you know, the, the economy is going to change. Houston's changed, you know, since Hurricane Harvey. Now you're going into new cities and those cities are different than Houston. There's different price points. There's different negotiations. There's, so you've got to keep audibleizing and changing. And, you know, we, we have grown into Dallas and Fort Worth from Houston. And we have learned that things that work in Houston don't always work. They don't always work in Dallas and Fort Worth. And probably the same in Austin when we go there. Um, different owners, different mindsets. You know, so you have to, you're going to have to tweak that and change it. You can't just say, well, this is how we did it in Houston. This is how we're going to do it there. So it's, it's very, very interesting that you're going through this. We're excited. We're, we definitely uh, see the value of having a coach to, to guide us through, through this experience. Cause we definitely wouldn't have been able to do it without his help. Yeah, no, that's great. Now, is everyone else buying into the traction and the model and everything? Is everyone in on that? Yeah, yeah, and we see the difference in how we were running our business before to how we're running it now. And we're actually getting ready to go meet with our coach. Uh, we're flying out tomorrow. Oh, good, good for you, good for you. So let me ask you, what's the plan for the end of 2019? What is, tell me what your business looks like December 31st, 2019. December 31st, uh, we will definitely, as soon as we set up uh, the Houston market, we're moving on to the next market. So by December 2019, uh, we will be in at least five markets. And now let me ask this. How do you guys, and, and uh, if I'm getting too, too into your business, let me know. But how do you guys plan to, to, cap, to, to fund that? You know, we actually have a couple of, um, we have a couple of, of uh, how do you say, they're, they're, cap, they're loans, they're, they're business loans that we've sure. been very fortunate to get to be able to help us fund this whole transition. That's great. That's great. That's great. So do you have any fears as far as that goes, or you're just kind of running it out and running the numbers like a business? Cause you, you seem like you're very emotionally detached. Um, it, it sounds like you're, you're very business minded. Hopefully they're the same, but do, do you have any fears on that? You know, I don't want to have analysis paralysis. Um, right. I see somebody else that is already successfully doing it. So if they can do it, why can't I? Absolutely. I agree. I mean, I, um, it's funny. I, I had been trained by someone and, uh, he was, he was a business hypnotist and, uh, it's kind of weird. So we're, we're with him working with him and he came and he said, you know, could your business do 
a million dollars this year. This is several years ago. And we said, yeah, we can do a million. He said, could you do five? We said, yeah, this year? He said, yeah, this year, could you do five? We said, I don't know. He said, well, let's say you push really hard. Could you do five? So to kind of make him happy, we're like, yeah, we could probably do five, which we knew we couldn't. Right. He goes, well, could you do 10? Could you do 10 million this year? And now I'm thinking, well, if I just barely could do five, I'm pretty sure I can't do 10. But I said, I don't think we could do 10. He goes, how about a hundred? Could you do a hundred million dollars? And I, I, I didn't understand what he was saying. And he says, what you don't understand is somewhere between one and five, you doubted yourself. And from 5 million to 10, you shut down and you didn't listen to anything from 10 million on. He said, but what if I told you I had someone that was going to give you a hundred million dollars into your business to make it grow? Right. He goes, but your, he goes, but your mind didn't even open up to that concept. He goes, you shut down. He goes, you were shutting down at five and after five, you completely shut down and you weren't open to that. He said, that is the reason why people fail in business because you are not even seeing the opportunities that walk past you every day because mentally you have already told yourself I'm done at five. He goes, and you weren't even sure you could get to five, but he goes, Google did it. Amazon, Yahoo. He goes, they've all got infusions of money and they've all grown exponentially. Right. What's the difference between them and you? Just, just like you said. And so it, it was a very interesting lesson for me to understand like, wow, I never really thought about it that way. And, and it, it just goes to show it's all in your mind, right? You, you, you succeed or fail from your mindset. And that's, that's investing, flipping, I don't care what it is, because at the end of the day, the way I think of it, and I don't know your thoughts, but you know, whether you own a rental property or anything, it's just a business. It, it's, it's, we're selling a product. That product is customer service. That product is peace of mind by buying a property, property management. We're just selling something different, but at the end of the day, we're all business owners. We're just selling different products. And so how you look at your business is really what determines your success or your failure, in my opinion. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, the way that I, the way that I look at the business is like, okay, um, it is a little bit scary, but it's exciting and it's going to get me to where I'm, I want to go. So I put that piece of fright back there. I try not to look at it, you know, and, and look forward to, to all the growth and success that we're going to have. No, oh, that's great. That's great. So Gloria, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you and they wanted to talk to you and maybe um, you know, get some properties from you or just talk about your business. How, how would they get a hold of you? Well, I am on Facebook um, as Gloria Gutierrez. Um, I, we're still in the process of setting our website up. Um, but like I said, we're on Facebook, on Instagram. Um, my phone number is 832-773-7698. And people can get a hold of me that way. Great, great. And uh, obviously this show will be on iTunes. You guys can download it on iTunes. You can go to our website, selfmanagemyproperty.com. It's on there. Um, Gloria, do you guys, do you have any kind of apps or programs that you just love and that you live off of that that's your daily Bible type thing? Um, apps or programs, you know, we use Podio heavily okay. um, to manage all of my leads on just a spreadsheet and try and keep up with it. There's no way I could do it with the volume of leads that we're getting right now. So definitely Podio is, is one, uh, one system that we use religiously every day. Got it. Got it. Great. Well, Gloria, thank you so much for being on. It sounds like you have a definitely clear path. I'm very excited to see how you do. And I'd like to have you on at the end of 2019 to see how you're doing and, and where you're going. And, you know, we all know that the road is going to have some bumps and that, that's all it is. It's just a bump and you, you keep on rolling with it. I mean, we, so we all have challenges, right? Yes, sir. Thank you so much for having me on. Okay. Well, again, and if anybody wants to go to our website, selfmanagemyproperty.com. Again, we do have the ultimate survival handbook there for all the people that want to self-manage. That is the book you need. Also, tons of free information on that website, free documents, free downloadable stuff. Go there. It's all free. Again, it's just our way to give back to help people. And again, please share this on iTunes, share it on Facebook with other people so that we can get the word out to other investors and go to our Facebook group, Landlord Survival Group on Facebook. Um, and again, we have multiple investors from all over the world on there that talk about investing and investing challenges. So once again, Gloria, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. And thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you, Steve, for having me. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. All righty. This has been the Landlord Survival Show. Join us next time for more of what the gurus don't tell you about owning rentals.
And for even more, find us on Facebook. Brought to you by Empire Industries Property Management. Built for investors by investors. For more information about this show, visit our website, selfmanagemyproperty.com, home of the ultimate landlord survival handbook. 